Good evening. I'm Calvin Sao, um, and um, today I welcome you to the Architecture League's current work lecture series. Um, and I'm very pleased um, to introduce you to Xu Tian Tian of DNA Design and Architecture from Beijing. Uh, I had the pleasure of actually um, meeting Tian Tian almost mm, 2008, many years ago when she uh, won the League Prize here. And I've been a fan of her work ever since. And you'll be in for a real treat tonight because she has a mode of practice that's rarely heard of in this country. And, uh, and she's been working with uh, in China in rural areas, in villages. And I'll let her tell you all about it uh, very soon. However, I would have to say that it also takes a village to have this lecture, this series presented to you because this program is in fact in, supported in part by the public funds from New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the city council and by the New York State Council of, on the Arts and with the support of the office of the governor and the state, New York State Legislature, if you can believe all of that. Uh, anyway, uh, this event of course is also organized by the Architectural League of New York and is co-presented by the Irwin S. Chainin School of Architecture of the Cooper Union. When normally if we are in person, we would be having that lecture there. And of course, I would take this opportunity to thank all the people who have been supporting us at the Architecture League. I thank the members and whose support make this, this lecture possible and many other pro programs. And of course, thanking you for attending this lecture. And if you have, want more information about the League membership and upcoming events, please visit the League's website, which is arcleague.org. Um, before we start, I just have to say um, that uh, because Tianjin is in Beijing, um, the internet connection might be a little bit of a problem, so please excuse. And uh, if there's a gap, I'll maybe sing a song or something to fill the space. Uh, but it should not be too many, uh, and hopefully not at all. And at the same time, it's like to know that this lecture is recorded, so all your coughing and sounds will be uh, imprinted in posterity. <laughs> Thank you. And without further ado, um, I introduce you to Xu Tian Tian. Thank you, Calvin. Um, so I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And before I start, uh, before we start the presentation, I would really like to take this opportunity to thank the Architectural League New York. Like Kevin mentioned in year 2008, 14 years ago, when we received the Young League Prize, our office DNA, design and architecture was just three years old, very young. So not only the prize itself has been a great encouragement to such a young office, what's more important is the theme resonance that has been a constant reminder in our practice. We believe that architecture is resonating with our environment, our history and culture, our people and community. And also architecture could also become an instrument to provide solutions and possibilities for our issues and challenges. So I would like to share this presentation um, as the reflection of our work and thinking. And thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, in past eight years, we have been mainly working in rural region in China. In this process, architecture is integrating with the local culture and context and heritage. Um, at the same time, architecture is also the remedy or healing treatment to revitalize the rural villages. 
So let's first start with our Songyan story, um, which is the collaboration with um, local county government and uh, village communities since 2014. With a minimal intervention approach, a public, um, a small scale public program is introduced to each village according to the its own um, context um, to serve the village and community to restore its rural identity and to and also to open up to rural cultural and educational tourism to stimulate um, the economic development. So um, after first year of um, working as village advisors um, on um, over a dozen of pro bono projects, uh, we proposed this um, architectural acupuncture as a systematic and uh, sustainable strategy targeting rural issues. Um, and it has become um, over 20 uh, uh, over 20 projects in this region a mapping system that um, each project is um, revealing its own identity of its location and reflecting um, the legacy of its own place at the same time all these projects are also building up a circulation within this region the Hakka Indenture Museum in this mountain village um, is to provide a new culture and um, public facility for the village. The um, indenture system is basically functioning as the legal foundation of Hakka society and the um, Hakka Indenture collection in this Shitang village is the largest collection in the country. Um, and this project also provide a opportunity to revive the long lost building uh, masonry building technique in this region. So the museum is functioning as a um, monument to Hakka indenture from the exterior. At the same time, it's also um, providing a archaeological interior to contemplate the history of Hakka indenture. The museum has also um, inspired new investments and business um, for rural cultural tourism in this village, which um, trains the um, local, the women from this village um, for the local crafts and production. For this one village located in the um, flatland, not too far away from the county urban center and um, has also been um, zoned as industrial district since the 90s, um, a new Wanjin Memorial Hall dedicated to the ancestor Wanjin is to restore the pride and honor for this ancient village. Wanjin is the um, imperial scholar from uh, Ming Dynasty and also one of the three most important and famous historical figures in Songyang County and a new memorial hall um, for the ancestor um, is located at the heart of the village. Um, the building is working with local material, for example, the ram earth walls and uh, uh, wood and stone. So the concrete uh, structure uh, corners are converted into um, uh, memorial corners um, with the stone carving technique presenting the lifetime of ancestor Wang Jin's um, life story. And the stone carving um, is manufactured by one of the factories next to the village. And since the completion of this memorial hall, the villagers are also inspired um, to initiate their and small businesses or uh, new cultural and educational programs um, with this museum. Um, in this process, we have also been looking into the um, abandoned structure or infrastructure 
For example, the Shimen Bridge um, connecting to villages, um, Shimen Village and Shimen Yu Village used to be a abandoned and unsafe um, infrastructure and was about to be demolished. So in year 2016, we um, proposed to the local government with a renovation plan to preserve the existing structure and to add a new wooden lounge um, as um, a pedestrian walkway and a public space shared by two villages across the river. Um, this is a new um, uh, assembly timber uh, structure um, addition to the existing bridge structure. And um, it's also functioning as a um, multiple um, purpose public um, space. And since the two uh, villages, Shimen and Shimen Yu, used to be one village back in the ancient time over 200 years ago and was eventually uh, separated into two by the flood. So this new Shimen Bridge is um, also the symbol of um, reunion of these two villages. Um, we also worked with natural uh, resources, for example, in this um, Hong Kong village, surrounded by um, bamboo forest, we have been working with live bamboo as building material and elements. This is very simple um, construction um, phase and um, um, process done by the local villagers and it creates a open space in the nature functioning as a, um, a theater in the nature. In rural region, um, the villages are sharing very similar agricultural lifestyle, but at the same time, almost every village has its own unique agricultural product, which is the, um, both the intangible cultural heritage and um, economic resource. The Kameli Oil Workshop is the renovation and uh, expansion of this abandoned, vacant um, historical workshop to provide a new um, production facility and shared meal house for the village. Um, the project has also become a new cultural facility platform to introduce the agricultural history and heritage of this Hong Kong village. Xing village is well known for its brown sugar production, which has become the key element to introduce or to restore this village identity. The traditional um, production of brown sugar is happening in the uh, family workshops, um, kitchens and um, um, it's a striking performance, but also comes with uh, critical um, sanity and safety issues. So a new uh, factory is built distanced from the village to accommodate the family workshops from this village um, by establishing a new villager union operating this factory. And the space is, um, the main uh, production space is conceived as a central stage and it's running for 24 hours a day and during the production season. So the, um, the sequence of the, um, the, the building uh, language, including lighting or coordinated lining up with the um, working, um, the workstations um, operated by different family workshops and um, this space is to showcase this um, production as live performance, um, indicating the village history and heritage. During the non-production season, the space is also um, functioning as a, a village center, uh, a public cultural space. Um, for example, uh, this is also a theater for the 
a puppet show group from the village. In Sajaya village, which is known for its um, best tofu product in the region, a new tofu factory is built at the entrance of the village, um, functioning as a shared common kitchen for the village. Again, this is also operated by a new village union integrating all the existing family workshops in the village. Um, the building is um, um, by is constructed by the assembly timber structure to create a dialogue with the traditional um, tenant and mortise wooden structure, traditional farmers' houses. All the different production compartments based on the sequence um, are becoming the um, episodes to introduce the traditional way of making tofu. And the visitors can take this parallel walkway to, uh, uh, to observe this um, production and performance. And this walkway is also functioning as um, public and leisure space for the visitors. And the factory has improved both the quality and price of tofu product from this village in the past years. A new Kuiming tea space in Chimu Mountain is the production workshop to revive the Kuiming tea making tradition. At the same time, it's also a cultural and leisure facility for um, visitors and local Shu ethnic minority villagers. The production together with tea planting and tea picking become the intuitive agricultural performance in the mountain. At the same time, the, um, the share culture is also integrated with the building. The pictograph blocks are arranged vertically um, based on the meaning of, the, um, of each symbols. So the wall becomes the image wall reconfiguring the hunting and um, farming history of Shur ethnic people in the mountain. The project is not only to integrate um, production and activities, but also to reveal the basic um, law of nature and agriculture. In ancient China, a day is divided into um, 12 zodiac hours um, based on the activity patterns of different animals. And a year is divided into 24 solar terms as the Chinese agricultural calendar. So in this building, the um, eight light tubes are oriented um, based on the sunlight angle um, of zodiac hours um, on the summer solstice day, which is the longest day in the year and the most celebrated festival around the world. And during the summer solstice time, the direct sunlight um, enter the space through the corresponding tubes from sunrise uh, rapid hour to sunset rooster hour and the space of t becomes the um, sundial to outline the trajectory of time and as well to um, reveal the life patterns of different species The experience working in rural region has inspired us to expand perspective, to identify issues, to re-evaluate local resources, and to initiate collaborations. This has brought us a new set of projects, the Jingyuan Quarries. When we were first invited by um, the neighbor county of Songyang, Jingyun uh, County, we were assigned with a different list of um, projects. Um, but after research and investigation, we proposed to focus on uh, the subject of quarry. The history of 
quarrying in Jinling is over a thousand years, and at the moment there are around three thousand quarries um, abandoned and closed up for um, over two decades. But you can tell the local communities are having very um, a strong sentimental connection um, with their quarries. So the project is to provide a model example for the rest 3,000 quarries to restore the interrupted nature and ecology. At the same time, to reuse these um, abandoned quarries as alternative public spaces with new possibilities. Since the original county urban center in Jingyun was constructed by the stones from these quarries, we also think that the adaptive reuse of these quarries um, can build up a dialogue with the history of the county urban center. Chizanyate 那以前我们打石头是很苦很苦的。嗯，早上六点左右到这里的，到了沙沙区来，到晚上六点左右，一天到晚。嗯，那个时候呢，坏了石头包，把石头是坏了石头包，一天到。So the planning is to look into a cluster of um adjacent abandoned quarries in a scenic district to provide cultural and leisure facilities such as quarry theater, library, or quarry restaurant and tea house. Our planning is to look into a cluster of adjacent um, abandoned quarries in a, dis in, in a uh, scenic district to provide new cultural and leisure facilities for this district and the village communities. So far, we have completed three quarries, quarry number 10, 9, and 8, and the rest will start um, construction as next, next phase. Um, quarry number 10 is the first of the cluster and um, will become an open stage for local quarry workers to demonstrate their live quarrying technique, which is very um, sentimental and, and passionate um, connection with these quarry workers. And quarry number nine and is converted uh, into a quarry theater because of its um, acoustical quality. And the adjacent quarry number eight with its maximum interior height and also the spectacular interior topography. This quarry is dedicated to the um, uh, cultural context and the calligraphy history and the spirit of literati in this area. Um, we call it the Book Mountain. This is a combination of a modern public um, reading library and a Chinese study. And then through a tunnel, you will walk to quarry number two and three, a semi-open space as tea house, um, and continue to take the walkway to pass um, through a water garden on the street, and then to sunset quarry, which is um, a terrace to look uh, look at the quarry from distance. Um, and, and then the next is quarry number four is carved out uh, downward into the ground. So this becomes a sunken restaurant with different seating terraces. And after the dinner at quarry number four, um, you can take the walkway up to the hilltop uh, where there is this um, platform 
after quarrying a terrace after quarrying so this is the moonlight quarry you can um, could take it as a camping site quarry uh, number two and three is the semi-open tea house with the central um, structural reinforcement the concrete bearing walls um, and a, a embedded with a stair And uh, the water garden is just a light uh, touch with waterfalls and um, um, the water pool next to street as a landscape spot. Um, our design is rather minimal intervention with only necessary traces to reveal the quarry as a new rural um, public space with collective memories. And um, the Sunset Quarry, since it's um, uh, safety issues and um, um, the intervention with this quarry is only a, a viewing terrace to observe from far distance and an enlarged um, fish pond in the middle can become the safety barrier. Next is quarry number four. Um, a sunken restaurant with different levels of seating terraces and a fish pond next to it. And Moonlight Quarry is the um, terrace at the hilltop. Uh,这些石窟呢，其实对于我们晋语人还蛮有意义的，因为在我的印象当中，就是我们爷爷那一辈有好多人都是以采石为生的。就在八零九零那个年代变化的话呢第一就是作为我们在围景区里面的话它也是为晋云增添了一处新的观光旅游的一个圣地吧然后会为我们当地的村民也带来一定的经济收入对于我们来说的话我觉得像咖啡厅
他知道内部空间比较狭小，但是它的单体的高差又比较大，大型的一些机械设备啊没法的进入，这是一方面。第二方面就是，呃，每个不同的石窟啊，它不同的岩壁啊有它不同的一些特点，因此我们在设计之前啊，对于不同的洞壁啊，要进行一些专业的一些探查，探查清楚过后，让再进行一些呃精细化设计。嗯、呃，第三个方面就是我们在加固设计之初啊，也希望。尽可能保持洞壁的一些原貌，尽可能不体现加固的痕迹。比如说我们现在这个这个石窟，尽管加固过了，但是我们基本上看不出那些加固的一些呃形状。嗯，所以在我们在加固过程中，在加固材料的选择和手段的选用上，也进行了一些专业的处理。Quarry number ten is the first of the cluster, and the program is um. Based on the request and desire of the local quarry workers and the local community, to provide a stage um, to demonstrate local uh, the quarrying as local manufacturing technique and historical heritage. At the same time, this also provides a resting and um, viewing platform for for visitors. Quarry number nine is right next to quarry number 10. It's the second of the cluster. And it was once used by local villages as a fish pond. So we consider this as the very um, local initiative on adaptive re reuse. And our design would like to preserve this part of the memory with a thin layer of water to create this walkway around the quarry. And because of its acoustical effect, especially the um, spatial reverberation effect, the, um, the quality, the space is um, perfect for uh, an, as to convert into a quarry theater. So 
either uh, it could work um, both ways. You could either use the central sunken space as the central stage, or take the um, just a, as a conventional uh, traditional stage for local U opera and the traditional opera performance. And again, this is with um, minimal intervention approach and our design uh, is rather um, minimal um, to um, it, only with this bamboo, um, prefabricated bamboo panels, um, bamboo railing to indicate a walkway or for the for visitors. Um, at the same time, the acoustical material, the sound absorbing materials are hidden behind these panels. Quarry number eight still pre preserves its original walkways and um, working terraces. It's almost like interior topography within this quarry. And the height of 36 meters um, inside the quarry gives you the um, sensation of mountain and cliff. So we wanted to take this as the opportunity to address to the local cultural context and the spirit of Chinese literati. This quarry number eight um, could really be kind of combination of public reading library and um, a Chinese study um, with the concept of book mountain. And, and here the architectural intervention is rather um, like installation carefully um, following the traces of this um, topography. It's rather a man-made topography. Again, this um, bamboo panels, railings are indicating um, 
the traces of human activities or movements, both to the original quarrying workers' um, walkways and to a new passage uh, to viewing terraces for visitors. In other words, the quarry is really um, the translation of an ancient poet, um, Chinese poet. The passage to the top of Book Mountain is through hard work. Recently, we have opened an exhibition at Ada's um, Architecture Forum in Berlin with the, uh, the quarry as a stage from economic exploitation to ecological reuse. And in this exhibition, we especially made the, uh, a model for uh, all these individual quarries with translucent material to um, present its geometry um, and the models are hanging and glowing in the center of space. We would like to dedicate this to um, the quarry workers. And these quarries are truly the artwork and spectacular monument um, made, handmade by the local quarry workers. So there's a lot of information today. And uh, before I wrap it up, I would like to briefly go through our current project, the Tulo chapter. 
many of you have heard of the uh, Tolo buildings as World um, Cultural Heritage by UNESCO. But what you don't know is that only 46 are listed, 46 Tolo buildings are listed as heritage uh, with preservation and protection. And there are thousands of Tulo buildings left unattended, vacant or um, abandoned in this region in Fujian province. So we're looking into a number of Tulo buildings, um, either to upgrade, to improve the living conditions for its original inhabitants or to um, reuse these Tulo buildings to convert them, these traditional buildings and uh, to accommodate modern functions with adaptive reuse. So we are very much looking forward um, to this new challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tian Tian. It was just astounding uh, what you showed. Um, And of course, I'm sure everyone's just dying to ask you a million questions, but I, being the moderator, I had the privilege to ask you first. Uh, one of my major questions is, you know, I do some work in China too, and most people, most architects see possibilities, opportunities in the metropolises, doing large commissions, museums, office buildings, uh, grand institutions and libraries. And I was just wondering whether you can tell me a little bit, what made you choose to work in the rural villages of China? A, a community, a society that's in the throes of rapid change and transformation, both uh, onwards, but sometimes of course, uh, destructive at the same time. Um, Calvin, I have to confess that we are the, not the mainstream architects or architecture office in China. So we, um, or the rural projects in, uh, started uh, since eight years ago, and that was really way before the uh, central uh, uh, government uh, um, having this um, rural revitalization policy in, in, in the whole country. And um, so in the beginning, it was all about just kind of a really the, it could be a, in, a personal interest and also kind of a really um, curiosity to the to the rural region, the villages. Um, and I think it was also the um, desire to see, well, you know, in the beginning we were just asked as, as advisors for the local villages. But then we realized that architecture can really become something to um, fix the issues and to bring in motivations and um, to inspire the local community for their own initiatives. And so, so that has become really um, kind of a, um, defining the trajectory of our projects in recent years. And um, I, I do think it's a new territory. We have many, um, we have a different issues, different challenges working in rural compared to working in, in, in urban situation. When in the cities, in um, metropolitan area, um, everything seems to be much more systematic and, or you can call it uh, more professional, but, in rural um, context, you have to take um, multiple roles, not only architect, but you also work as a communicator to um, discuss with the, with the villagers, to communities, and also to find a solution. Uh, first, you have to take to, to identify the issues, the problems, and also to identify the resources, the hidden treasure in the village from the... Oops, this is our first techno technical glitch. I hope it doesn't take too long to get Tian Tian back. Um, I threatened to sing a song, but I don't think anyone would want that. Uh, I was just really 
uh, floored by the fact that uh, in China, there's a huge mass exodus from the rural area into the urban cities, creating a, a really actually a lot of social problems in the city. Uh, at the same time, uh, the rural areas was filled with old people, the young people were always leaving. Um, and, you know, it creates a real big social imbalance within the, the, the country. And so what she, she's doing is kind of injecting and a new new energy into a rural, it's like some some kind of rural reform, rural initiative that could actually make uh, non-urban societies uh, a viable place for for future generations. Very much like what's happening here in New York, uh, or in place in this country where. Uh, many people are moving out of the city into the rural areas and started uh, creating uh, farming or um, producing uh, cheeses and um, bakeries all around. In fact, um, I've been living in New York, in upstate New York the last two years, and it's amazing how vibrant it has become. So I don't know whether it's a global trend or not, but trend or not, I think balancing uh, rural areas and nature and man-made and urban is probably something that architects can all spend more time uh, discovering and exploring. Ah, there she is back. Oh, well, that's our first little technical glitch. Um, my apologies. Um, I, I was um, I was going to say that yes uh, I I believe that and actually re it, it's really happening with the, our practice in rural we see the new trends that um, in the um, in the past years we have seen uh, young people uh, returning to the home village to the county to the home villages from the from the cities and the number is that I think in a in a recent you know past three years maybe it was also because of pandemic there have been over five thousand young villagers returning home and at the same time um the way we're working with uh the Songyang county with the local especially the, the production agricultural production um has become a new kind of economic reform in the region because um the villagers used to be rather individual family workshops, right? engaging with the market economy. And with all these factories, they uh, it, uh, every factory has a new um, you, villager union established to integrate all the family workshops as the shareholders of their, um, so that every factory, production factory is rather a collective economic entity. It's like the co-op system um, in US. So that really helps to um, enforce their um, economic or uh, revenue, to improve their revenue in this process. Uh, the price is uh, increased and also the, the product pr uh, quality is also improved. So in that sense, um, it really brings a new, um, inspiration, not only motivation, but also new inspiration for the villagers to see how they could work with their heritage, with their agricultural um, products. And this is the also the reason um, for the young people currently living in cities to see the opportunities back home. Well, that's, that's you know, what you're doing is in the way, as I see it, is with your architecture, you're also uh, transforming things through social engineering, correct? Right, right. And, uh, and it's actually a very important moment in China where this exodus, as when you were frozen, I was talking about uh, the exodus from the rural areas to the cities creating social problems in the city, as well as a kind of a vacuum in the, in, in the rural areas. Um, and and because China, uh, you know, uh, 
move so quickly in the last 40 years. I think they've been managed to do a lot in the urban areas, but they haven't really addressed uh, really a large portion of China, which is still in the rural areas. And I, I'm really impressed that you have uh, taken it you know, full on. And even though you say you're not a conventional practice, well, you know, what is conventional? I mean, why do you need to be conventional? I, I, I think it's really important to look at these various areas and to hear you talk about it. Now, we have a lot of questions, in fact, from the audience. Some of them very pragmatic, like, well, you know, what happens when it rains <laughs> in the quarries? <laughs> How the, you know, the book's gonna get, get wet. Um, and also something like, um, well, what about, you know, a hand, uh, handicap access and, and um, issues of that nature. Um, would you like to address some of the, the, the challenges in, in, and also the standards that we normally in this uh, outside of China would take, you know, great, becomes very, great priorities in our, our functional solutions? Sure, sure. Um, uh, with the quarries, um, the first three quarries are rather open spaces. And we also have quarries in the second phase, they're covered, right? Um, half open or um, at least sheltered um, space for um, tea house or, or restaurants or for other um, programs. But um, for this first three quarries, it was just, a, it, it was more like a demonstration of how we can reuse these quarries without intensive, massive um, investments in terms of uh, time and money. And, and um, but think about the rural activities. Actually what's happening in rural is that um, local villages, communities, they have activities according to the weather. Um, and of course their agricultural activities is also based on, on the weather. And, uh, and it was just a very kind of a, easy, relaxed attitude. If it rains, nobody comes to the region. It's, a, it's a, in the rural region, nobody comes and uh, villagers will stay indoor. So it's a quite a different kind of attitudes from what we are having in the cities um, where we have a very fixed, you know, public activities um, happening in a designated um, building, theater, museum, libraries. Um, and also events are pre-scheduled. So that's what I mentioned during the, 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 the talk, the um, uh, lecture, that it really raised a new question of whether we could um, work with um, our public activities uh, programs into more open space. Um, so it, it, it's a... So it's a beautiful thing from our uh, president, Paul Lewis, who said many fan really fantastic work and many projects you've shown have a fluid connection between interior and exterior, blurring the distinction and such that they merge into a coherent intertwining. Can you elaborate the reason for this architectural strategy specific to these rural sites? And I would like to add that, uh, you know, th that the fact that the way you intertwined with the bamboo uh, project and uh, and the uh, quarry project where you really intersect with nature, whether it's uh, nature already corrupted by man, like the quarries, but still very much part of nature and working with, or working with daylight, the way light goes through. I would love to hear more about that, that aspect of your work as well. Um, first of all, it's the tradition. It's really the uh, space, the character of the space in architectural space in rural region. Um, in this region, um, and where most of the farmers' houses are semi uh, semi open to the nature. Um, for example, the you know with the courtyard building, building we have this central courtyard that open to the sky to bring in um, natural light, natural mm -hmm. air, and um, so we want to take this kind of a, um, um, 
architectural space um, character, how um, it's building is really more interfering with the nature, with the light, with the fresh air, the breeze in the space, even the water coming into the space. And that's just not uncommon in the region. And, um, and also there was also a, um, a, a strategy because it's actually more sustainable in a way for it's a low kind of a low tech sustainable uh, sustainability um, and the buildings uh, is not like our um, modern buildings in architecture in the city uh, where it's uh, um, totally artificial or air conditioned. Um, so this, uh, all these buildings, um, you look at the factories, you look at the, all the uh, ancestors halls or the local Hakka indenture museums or the uh, um, quarries, they are all um, natural lighting, natural ventilation and with low maintenance. Um, it, it really adopts this um, method of low maintenance in, in a way. So it's rather a much more casual space. It doesn't require a um, door or entry point checking. So it's normally it's just open or open to the to the general public, like the um, ancestors hall, the traditional ancestor hall in the village. And it's open for everybody. And it's not occupied 100% uh, of the time. And only, um, but it's really crowded when it comes to holidays or their um, events, for example, um, weddings or bangays. So there's a different kind of uh, um, occupancy or function um, with public spaces in rural. It's very different from our modern life. I guess it's, um, and I think it's really a tradition from the, um, agricultural uh, lifestyle. Um, so yes, all these places, you look at each building in our projects, it's always a multi-purpose um, public space. Um, either the um, a museum could be a summer pavilion or the factory could also functioning uh, could also function as a um, villager center or a cultural space or educational classroom, and so that was all kind of our. I, I would say that was all strategic when you before you start the design phase. Well, someone said that you must do a lot of research, and and I looks like you know obviously. Uh, you were trained as an architect, no different than the rest of us, I presume. Uh, and so this is to, to dive into this kind of thinking, this kind of solution making, it requires a lot of sensitive, not just normal research, but kind of a deep dive into a sensibility, into a culture, right? Uh, into a way of life and all the nuances. And then you, of course, imbue it with poetics as well. Um, so there's all these factors, forces going, moving, both on a cognizant, but also on a very spiritual and, and personal interpretation of, of, the, of the knowledge that you, you've gathered from, from these research, uh, this research, correct? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think I really, I feel like I've been learning so much from from rural life. And um, at the same time, it's also very inspiring. And these are not the, the knowledge that we could get from our education. Um, and in, in that way, I would say that, um, and also that's not the knowledge we could gain with our life in cities either. So I do find that it's, um, um, if, with all these projects, with all these communication discussions with the villagers, um, we have been um, gaining or learning so much from this local culture. And at the same time, the rural life, you know, uh, when, when, we, uh, when, when it's facilitated, 
facilitated with our modern infrastructure, uh, uh, the broadband uh, connection and road um, access. And um, can you hear me now? I great. Yes, we do. Okay. We can hear you. <laughs> So uh, we have 15 more minutes. I would love to squeeze in a few more questions. Uh, one is actually very interesting is that uh, question was, this is a wonderful uh, material. Is it scalable? Because you know, you're working with one particular village uh, and is the knowledge and insight that you've, that you've developed for that particular region is it scalable in some way so that can be applied to other regions, other rural agent regions in China? Yes, definitely. That's the way we've been not only to look in, you know, just to look at one piece of architecture as the, um, you know, as the final goal, but actually um, in the process architecture is the means, is our strategy. Um, to work into a systematic um, and sustainable strategy. So that is the um, um, our purpose, um, the, the, the main goal to introduce to other regions. And with the quarry, uh, that's also the similar um, situation that we wanted to take the quarry, this cluster of quarries, instead of only articulating into one quarry to make a, a um, infinite architecture. We take a cluster of quarries and really make it into a very practical solution. Um, all these quarries, our first visit to quarries was last um, April, last year. So, and three quarries already finished within six months. And it all happened in very short phase compared to the other buildings. Um, and that was also intentional to make it as, um, the whole project, quarry project, is a to provide a model example for the rest three thousand quarries in the region and many more quarries in the country and I guess worldwide. Um, so we just wanted to reevaluate uh, the value of um, local resources. The quarries were considered as the waste of the industry, abandoned or um, abandoned industry. But then there are new opportunities for these quarries. And it's also the same thing with the um, Tulo project. Instead of taking one Tulo and make it really a beautiful um, um, object, you know, with um, extensive design, we take a number of Tulos and look into different issues, different symptoms, and to provide um, our project as a solution. So, so Tian Tian, there's a very um, kind of a, this elemental question. You know, we are, are I, I presume all uh, architectural education uh, do not prepare you for this kind of practice. Um, and it does make you ask question, what is an architect? And what is the range of work that, that that what is domain of architecture? Because we said earlier that you're actually going into social engineering, you're working uh, as kind of way to, to, um, to uh, animate uh, an entire community through your work. Um, can you speak to how you went from your normative architecture education to arriving to this way of practice? Sure. Um, I, I think our, well, before I started to work in the Duro, um, I, I do think we, we had a, a different um, perspective or, on architecture, and that is more focused on what you can make, um, you know, um, back in the studio, what in your imagination, what you can um, create. And that's the main body of our, our um, architectural education and practice. Um, but, and uh, we, I just discovered that um, for many times it doesn't work. Um, it's not really confronting um, the real issues in rural. 
when where most of the time we initiate uh, and have to improvise. And we, like I said, we have to work with multiple roles. Um, so we are also the planner. We, we brought up this, um, we have to analyze the issues and at, at the same time, we need to collect all the information the local on local resources and um, elaborate into a practical proposal, which is um, definitely has to be low budget. And at the same time, doesn't require extensive construction. So um, working in this condition, you always come up with um, just whatever it, it is there is convenient, handy. Um, so you will see that projects having different material, um, different uh, kind of a, um, um, construction. It, it's uh, it's pretty much every project is um, constructed by the contractor, the villagers from its own village. So it always come up with a um, different. Um, um, request or different uh, techniques uh, in a way. And, and for example, in the mountain village, we are able to work with um, more um, natural material, stone material, or we work with a timber assembly structure, which, which is easy to assemble, to, to construct. But on the flatland where you can gain uh, more of the uh, modern um, construction materials and technique. So, Changing the subject a little bit, um, many people are curious to how, okay, so you want to go into the rural areas to, to do this kind of amazing work. How did you manage to get these commissions? Um, and another question comes from someone from India who wants to do something similar in India. Uh, the question is, how do, you, how do you get this kind of commission? How do you, how do you go about uh, because obviously uh, rural villagers are not going to send an RFP uh, for competition in, 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 in design. Um, do, can you elaborate on how you mentioned earlier, somehow you were, went in and advisor, but who asked you to be a consultant or advisor to the village and, and how, how does the whole process work? And can that be, and, and how could someone else replicate it or try to go the same path? Because this is a very unusual career path. Right, right. Um, it's you're right. We are not um, waiting for uh, the given commission. Um, these are project. Th these projects are not um, the conventional <clears throat> commissioned project. Um, when we were just sitting in the office, we went to the <clears throat> rural region and. We have to come up with, um, we, we, and this is the uh, the solution that doesn't require um, extensive investment. So basically, well, it and and it's also within um, certain range of um, um, budget. Um, so that could be the um, almost become risk free for local governments. And, and also we wanted to, to use, take our proposals to push for the public funding for these projects in, in the rural villages and the rural region. So you actually went and engaged them and made suggestions and they sort of liked it. And, but but who, who's your client? Is exactly. it the local mayor? The local government, it could ah. be the, um, right, it could be the county uh, government or or the local township, uh, the town uh, uh, authority as the public uh, client, or the village collective uh, community as the collective client. So did you approach them or did they, how did they come about to approach you? The first Song Yan story was um, a. We started, like I said in the in the presentation, we started with the year of pro bono projects with uh, over a dozen projects, 
and then there was a kind of a, a, a um, process that we understand uh, each other and get familiar with each other. And later on, we brought up, they, they asked uh, if we could continue to work in the county because they really, you know, as a mountain, small mountain county, they really need um, architects. Um, so then we, uh, we proposed maybe we can work into a strategy. And, and then that, that kind of started the collaboration for, um, you know, for in total, that was eight years. Um, so the this, this success of Songyan's story, you know, with people, with the young villagers moving back with the villagers, um, really building up their identity and sense of a pride um, in, the, in the past years with this acupunctural uh, projects. We were also approached by different counties, uh, for example, the Jingling County, the Quarry County. Um, and also they, well, there was just a kind of an initial um, um, request for research, but we were given with different, uh, a list of the different type of projects. Um, and then after the research, we, we actually, proposed to the local, the, to the county, this is county government that um, instead of working with the given uh, possible projects, we would like to take the quarry as the subject in this case. And then we brought up our design after many meetings and uh, every meeting has, um, um, you know, a, a, a room pack of people in, um, you know, uh, local authorities and village communities, the, the um, engineers, um, and then also the, the local uh, quarry workers. So there was after many discussions, meetings, and finally the project was approved. Um, and then we were able to get the commission. <laughs> well, that means you really go and really create, do it, develop a real relationship uh, and, uh, and really based on trust and, and, and understanding uh, from a very fundamental level, which is really amazing. Um, someone was saying that, uh, asking what, you know, whether it will be very interesting to go back and see how these spaces are being used over time. Uh, do I suppose we'll have plans to, to continue to stay with these communities, correct? Yes, yes, we visit um, many times. I have been to the, the place uh, uh, over a hundred um, uh, trips um, already. And yes, every time we would visit some of the projects, not all of them, but we also um, kind of a follow, we have a follow-ups with these projects. That's great. That's you. You're basically embedded in a community. You're right. I feel like I'm a local in the region. Yes. <laughs> well, that's the best way to serve a community is to be part of it, isn't it? Right. Right. Well, um, we actually have many, many more questions, and I hate to disappoint everyone by not being able to raise them to you, to you uh, tonight. Um, as I said before, we will collate them and we're trying to get them answered. Um, Tianjin, I hope you, you'll be able to, to do that either hopefully in the fall in person and also maybe we'll send you the questions and you could help us answer it and then we can distribute it back to the audience. Sure, that will be my pleasure to do and so. It, so I, I'm afraid this time just flew by and uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, it's been very inspirational, and uh, we look forward to actually seeing you and meeting you in person, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for for taking this time to uh, to take in this webinar, and I hope you will join us again in our future lectures. And uh, with that, I bid you all good night, and uh, have a good evening.